Welcome back to the final episode of Living History. We've been talking with Ted Goldsboro and about Ted's life and times growing up in Narberth. We left off in Greece. Okay. So a let's long way from Narberth. Yes, that's a long way. So to bring us back to Narberth. Okay. My wife and I were very fortunate. The Air Force paid for us to uh, travel. Well, they didn't. But we were. I was in the Air Force, and we had some leave time, and we were in Greece. And then we uh, finished our European tour and went to the British Isles and came back. And uh, I was uh, hired to be an eighth grade English teacher at Ballackinwood Junior High School. And that's it right which there? Which is at 510 Bryn Mawr Avenue in Ballackinwood. Now it's a middle school, but in those days it was built in 1939, the same as my birth year. And I taught there for 18 years. Mm -hmm. This shows the front of the school. It has a very impressive... Um, lobby and, and front. And I see here you're hard at work. A uh, picture of me in my <laughs> classroom with my suspenders on. <laughs> always with, remember uh, those suspenders. <laughs> always with some kids. And then in 1968 I'd begun teaching in 66 at Ballacan and two years later mm -hmm. uh, only making six thousand six hundred dollars mm -hmm. we were able to buy a twenty thousand dollar house in Ballackinwood. Uh, which was about six blocks away from school, so we could have one car and I rode a bicycle to school. Yeah. Uh, getting off the subject a little bit, but this is my sister Peggy, the one who had polio. This is she in California with a Dutch door. She lives in a 1938 <laughs> uh, cottage that oh. overlooks the Pacific in Newport wow. Beach, California. She married an oil city boy, the, the, the man next door to my grandmother's house. Wow. He, he came to Drexel Institute. He was an, an engineer, mechanical engineer, and he met my sister when he was in uh, Drexel. And Peggy was still in high school. There's seven years difference between them as oh. they were with my parents. But uh, he went into the Navy. He was stationed in the Pacific. And then they got married in 57. And they lived in Ohio out in California. And here's a picture of my sister and her husband in California. They've been married over 55 years. Oh, God bless them. That's wonderful. And then oh, I, yes. um, I have a son up in Maine named Jack. So he and I are... Uh, hugging each other <laughs> in Maine. We don't see each other too much, but uh, that's my son, Jack. And there's Jack and his two boys. Oh. Um, and now, this is several years later, the older boys graduated from high school a few years, and he's driving a bus, school bus. Oh, wow. And the younger boy is a junior, I think, or maybe a senior in uh, high school. So, and here's Jack, and we went to an antique automobile automobile museum called Owl's Head up in Maine. Oh, nice. Jack runs a jewelry business, nice. so here he is in his jewelry store Very nice. in Maine. Nice. I have a, a son, John Goldsboro. Mm -hmm. He's on the right side, and my brother-in-law, Dan Clark, the one from Oil City, is on the left. My son, John, graduated from Lower Marion and Swarthmore College and so on and so forth. Here's another picture of John. He works in the district attorney's office in Philadelphia. Wow, good for him. He has a very good singing voice. Mm. And when he was a kid at Lower Marion, uh, he and another Narbeth boy, Dan Buchanan, from the South Side, Chestnut Avenue, mm. uh, were selected to sing in the United States All Eastern Chorus up oh, in Boston. Impressive. I have a daughter, Jenny, who graduated from Lower Marion. Mm -hmm. uh, she, too, is a musical person. She went to Oberlin College. And uh, she is, this is her graduation from Oberlin College in 1990. She married a Japanese man, but they're divorced now. She works for Educational Testing Service in Princeton. Mm. And she has a dog, Percy, and Grandpa just loves Percy Aww. Boy. And this is her son, Kay, and her son, Koji. And both of them are very musical. They have sung in the American Boy Choir really? in Princeton. They've toured the world. They've been to Korea. They, <laughs> And that's wow. my wife, Susan. I haven't talked too much about Susan other than the wedding picture. <laughs> uh, we gather sometimes for family reunions. Mm -hmm. This happens to be down in Maryland uh, where we get the whole family together. That is a big and family. In the summertime, we go to Chautauqua in northwestern New York State. So this is a family picture in New York State. Very nice. This uh, is very interesting. Well, we were on a trip, and we were staying at a bed and breakfast in Plains, Georgia. And if uh, the audience knows Plains, that's where President Carter was from. And the landlady said, if you all are willing, you might go to church tomorrow. Jimmy's preaching. 
Jimmy so Carter. Thought, Jimmy Carter's <laughs> preaching. So we, whoa. <laughs> so we went to church, and first you started with adult Bible school. Okay. And you're sitting in metal folding chairs, and this lady's next to me, and she's kind of squirming around. Well, it was, it was Mrs. Carter. I <laughs> uh, so next to the president's wife, and Jimmy had his arm in a sling, and he said that he was up cleaning his rain spouts with his leaf blower, and he fell off the ladder. Oh, no. <laughs> the president cleaning leaves up. But anyway, after church, uh, the <laughs> rector said, priest said, parish or whatever, I don't know, the Methodist church, I don't know, Baptist church, uh, they said, any of you all like to have your pictures taken with President Carter, he'll be available. So I went outside. I thought to be a professional photographer, you know, <laughs> give him 10 bucks. <laughs> and we got outside, and there's nobody around. And I'm looking around, and they said, excuse me, would you take these folks' picture? No. So it was just somebody in the parish, you know. And with I their thought, own personal yeah, camera. Yeah, you know, well, it was my camera, but I, oh, I, okay. I was hoping, you know, I hope you got you, you me in. You took your camera you? to church? <laughs> yeah, my camera to church. Oh, yeah, I always have to have a camera. <laughs> I got one right here. <laughs> so... Um, we got a picture of Susan and me and Jimmy Carter, and we traveled around town. So That's that was quite so a thrill exciting. to meet the president. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right, where is this? Okay. I think I know well, where this is. Well, when I was living in Ballacumwood, I was only about six houses away <laughs> oh, wow. from the Union Fire Company. And ever since I was a little kid in Arbor, I always wanted to be a fireman. All right. Is that so, what this, this so, article is talking uh, yeah. about? Yeah. After three years, it was really hard. I'm sure. Uh, Carol and I were talking about midnight calls and two o'clock in the morning calls. And I remember the first call when I was a fireman, you know, okay, Goldsboro, you're ready. You know, next time the bell rings, you come. And they put a bell in your house. We had a, a bell telephone bell, like that. And uh, I grabbed my clothes and went riding my bicycle up to the firehouse. And uh, the first fire, we pulled up and there's flames coming out the window. And I, oh God, you know, oh. I want to go back home to mama oh, and no. put me in bed and have my nice dog and cat. <laughs> And uh, as we're going around the back of the house, one of the firemen said, follow me, Goldsboro. And we ran around the back of the house and there were people had jumped out of the second floor window and they're moaning, and, oh. oh, help. And fortunately a policeman came and he kind of tended to the help. And we went in and tried to put out the fire. But after three years of that, I just couldn't take it anymore. It was just too hard to come in and teach school the next day when you've been out fighting a fire all night. So I said, I can't do it. The balance you know, I, is very hard, yeah. Yeah, I quit. Too hard. Yeah. I was also I was interested in bicycling. Uh -huh. We wanted bicycle committees. We wanted routes for bikes. So these, uh, it so happened that this is about the time that 18-year-olds were allowed to vote in elections. Right. So there was a, a federal program, it was called Project 18, mm -hmm. to prepare the high school kids for the responsibility of voting. And this is Ann Bagley, and uh, I had written her name down here, uh, Judy Ostro, and Ted Goldsboro, and Ken Lubar. Ken's the student. And um, we held meetings, and we went around, we made presentations to different groups, civic groups, to school groups, promoting the idea of bicycling. Mm -hmm. And there's an article about Kinwood Man starts the ball for bicycling, talking about Project 18. And Isn't then I had a bike class, an elective class at Bala Kinwood down in the basement of the Lower Marin Academy, which ironically is where the Lower Marin Historical Society mm -hmm. is today. But I taught boys and girls about how to repair bicycles. Wow. Uh, also, because I graduated from Lower Marion, uh -huh. uh, I've always been proud of being a Lower Marionite. As I am, too. <laughs> and I represented the class of 1957, which was a significant year because the next year, 58-59, mm -hmm. Harriton opened. Oh. So we were the last year before, and oh. so we were a real powerhouse because we had both yeah, Marburn and Harriton. Your large class, yeah. yeah. And in alumni events over the years, I've marched and represented my class That's of 57. That's nice, very nice. All right, what is this picture? Well, when Susan and I were in Great Falls, Montana, one day I was riding my bicycle to the Air Force Base, and I saw a 1938 Ford for sale, and it said like $175, oh. and I thought, oh boy, I'd love to have that 38 <laughs> Ford. So I was so hoping, you know, ride your bike fast, get home, get some money, and go up and buy that car. 
and I did. And Susan and I drove that car from Montana down to visit my sister in Southern California. Really? We came all the way up the West Coast, you know, up to Vancouver, Canada, cross in the winter time, no heater. Oh, dear uh, Lord. Stopped in Michigan at the Ford Museum and drove it all the way down to Ballackinwood. Oh, <laughs> this is the Lorimer Academy, which was built in 1812, one of the first public schools in this area. Mm -hmm. That's building. where the Lorimer Historical Society is a beautiful building. It is. Uh, we rent the commission, the, excuse me, the Lorimer Academy Board of Trustees rents this building to the Lorimer School District. And the school district pays $50 a year in rent to rent this building. Uh, over the years, it's been used for home economics classes for my bike repair class down in the basement. Uh, they have meetings in it. In fact, the Boy Scouts meet there. The Lower Marion Historical Society is in there. So that's my 38 Ford with magnetic signs. We're probably going to drive it in a parade for the Lower Marion Historical Society. Oh, nice. The Lower Marion School District maintains the building. We have just a few minutes left. Unfortunately, oh. it went by so quickly, <laughs> but I wanted to, to take the time to thank the viewers for watching our final episode of Living History, but I also wanted to give you an opportunity. This is your show, so All sign right. us off, Oh, please. thank you, Carol, thank you. I wanted to mention my choir director. For four years, I sang in the Allegheny College Choir a cappella group. His name was Morten Luvas, a Norwegian man. He was nearing the end of his career, so I was very lucky to be able to sing for four years under the direction of Morton Luvas, and I love singing in the choir. We made beautiful sounds, we recorded records, we went on tours, we stayed in people's houses, we often sang in churches or auditoriums and that kind of stuff. But uh, thank Morton Luvas for influencing my life. Another person who influenced my life uh, is General Julius Becton. And I have a picture from uh, General Becton's autobiography. And he does mention uh, Lower Marion in there. He grew up in Bryn Mawr. His father was a custodian in an apartment building near the Baldwin School. I did an oral history on him. Here he is signing his autobiography with an African-American woman named Tricia Pottinger. And in about 10 days, Tricia is getting her PhD from the University of Minnesota. And I'm terribly proud of her and glad that I know both of them. There's a picture here. General Becton came back when we had a moment of integration uh, ceremony, and that uh, was when Wendell Holland and Michael Antonopoulos did a living history program. General Becton is there in the center talking to the superintendent of schools at that time, Dr. McGinley. Um, I give historic tours, I give tours of uh, historic Lower Marion to the Lower Marion School District, two-hour bus tours, they provide the bus and I do the talking. <laughs> uh, so there are pictures of me giving those bus tours. Another person that has influenced my life is a guy named Ed Minchel. Ed graduated from Lower Marion in 1946. He lived in Penwin. His parents and uncle worked for auto car. Ed worked for auto car. So the auto car company has, um, was made in, uh, the auto car company was on Lancaster Avenue in Ardmore. And I've enjoyed knowing Ed Minchel and learning about the auto car. This is a picture of an early Lower Marion police wagon that was an auto car. During World War II, auto car made armored trucks, uh, half tracks, they also made what became fire engines. Uh, the auto car company made the chassis, the wheels, the engine, but if you, you got the body made in a body shop somewhere. But this is about a 1948, I think, but I could be mistaken, auto car owned by a man named David Monteith. This is the, the picture of the last auto car coming out of the assembly plant in Ardmore in 1954. Auto car was bought by the White Motor Car Company and moved out Route 30 to Exton. And then Volvo bought them, and now they make trash trucks in Indiana. In the wintertime, Goldsboro runs a snowblower. <laughs> so, <laughs> showing how I shot snow all over this poor neighbor's uh, windows. I shouldn't have done that. I should have realigned the snow chute. 
Uh, now I wanted to end with a picture of my father, of course, who influenced my life, as both my parents did. Uh, this is the last picture of my father, and I took it in March of my senior year in college. Uh, he died in May during my graduation, the week I graduated. He and mother were going to come out to Meadville, but uh, he died that week of a heart attack at Drexel. And then there's an obituary article from the New York Times. And that's all. Uh, I wanted to thank the people who have helped me with this show for five years, um, particularly the technicians, uh, Mark Murray and Josh Mackley, who have been really great to work with, and their boss, uh, Tom Walsh. Uh, we're grateful. Brenda Viola, oh. uh, who is no longer in the township, uh, is the one who approve this initially, and I thank her for giving that approval. Um, thinking back to uh, all the people who consented to be interviewed, 30 people, wow. and some of them are no longer with us because old age uh, mm. took its toll, but I've learned so much from interviewing those people and about their lives, and um, I'm glad to live in Lower Marion Township be able to afford to live in Lower Marion mm -hmm. Township and uh, to have the Lower Marion School District where I and you mm -hmm. and our children went through, my children went through, um, and for being my employer for uh, a combined total of 50 years, my mm -hmm. wife and I uh, taught for 50 years combined, and the Lower Marion Historical Society, uh, which I've enjoyed working with. So anyway, it's time to sign off, Carol. Thank you very much for your help. No, it was my pleasure. Thank Absolutely you. my pleasure. Thank you. Oh, this is Ted Goldsboro signing off from Living History. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I've enjoyed very much uh, being your host for the past five years. Goodbye. <laughs>